Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to HSC's National Virtual Conference. I'm Ian Foss, I'm the National Director of Development with HSC, and today it is my pleasure to introduce you to our keynote speaker, Dr. Ray Truant, Huntington Disease Researcher and longtime, longtime Huntington Society of Canada, Canada Scientific Advisory Board Chair. Dr. Truant has been researching HD since 1999 at McMaster University, where he now leads the Truant Lab. He is currently full professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Biomedical Sciences, as well as co-director of the new McMaster Center for Advanced Light Microscopy. Dr. Truant will kick off the conference by, by discussing what clinical trials taught us and how HD therapeutic development is accelerating in 2022. This informative and engaging session will look at how drugs are being developed and trialed with the real goal of preventing disease onset or delaying disease by decades. Truly groundbreaking breaking research. And now it's over to Dr. Truett. Thank you, Ian. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and share my screen for this presentation and welcome everybody. And I'm gonna turn on my User pointer. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ray Truant, and I've been an HD researcher since I started my lab here at McMaster in 2000. And um, from 2007 to 2021, I was uh, chair of the Scientific uh, Advisory Council, a scientific and member of the board or board officer for the Huntington Society of Canada. Um, so what I'm gonna give you today is, is uh, a good news story. I think right now with what's going on in the world in many different ways, we could use some good news stories, but this is really, I think, turning out to be a very exciting news story. So just before I give my talk here, as anyone who gives a talk uh, like this, I have to, I should mention, I have declarations, right? So I do have relationships with Novartis Pharmaceutical Company as a consultant and uh, past collaboration with PTC Therapeutics. It's important because I'm going to be talking about work from both of these companies. Um, okay, so 2020 was a year. Um, we had a lot of challenges and um, a lot of this personally at the lab level and research level and of course at the clinical trial level. Uh, as I'm sure most people are aware, the Tom and Erson trial uh, from Roche and Ionis was halted by an independent review committee. The WAVE trial from WAVE Pharmaceuticals was halted by an independent review committee for futility. So uh, basically the drug was, was not working. Um, so the reason why the trial was stopped with the Roche trial is there were some concerns that the disease measures were higher than anticipated. Um, the complete data from this trial is not going to be opened up completely until it's officially finished in June of 2022. So I'm not gonna talk about it any further because if you've seen any other presentations from Roche prior to this, you know what I know. And um, basically th there's nothing new to talk about until we, until we see the new data in June. But one thing that may be surprising to a lot of people is uh, this was not actually a very bad thing for the HD community. Uh, as soon as the, the news of those trials hit the press, uh, the amount of biotech and venture capital investment into Huntington's research spiked in a way that really surprised me. Um, it, it was very clear that there was a lot of people in the background thinking about therapeutics for Huntington's disease that were worried about investing in it because they were worried that a, a drug may already be a, a ahead of them in development. Um, so the reality is that the amount of interest in HD research from pharma is never been this high, uh, which is fantastic. And it seems to have grown in 2021 and again in 2022. And I'm gonna cover some of, of what's going on with that. From my lab's perspective, we actually took advantage of the whole situation. Um, we were really literally shut down for five months because my lab is, is sitting in a hospital um, and the lab became a think tank. So what we ended up doing was actually getting a lot of data out into the press 
that uh, you know we were waiting to get published, uh, we sat down, we wrote a lot of review articles for the HD community um, to sort of bring them up to speed on, on what we've been doing in DNA damage research in Huntington's disease. And we really took advantage of, of taking a breath uh, before we, we started a series of new projects. Coincident with all of that, um, the lab has managed to secure a record level of new funding, which is absolutely important. So I'm just going to bring us all, give you the 101 on these drugs that's, uh, that have been in the trials of the, the new classes of drugs that are coming down the pipe. Um, you've heard a lot about these anti-sense oligonucleotide drugs, or ASOs. This is what Tom and Nursen is, uh, the Roche drug, right? And this, uh, you know, ridiculously overstyled cartoon of what goes on inside of the cell, we see the DNA here in yellow, and the DNA is being opened up and read to produce RNA, and RNA is what produces protein, and this purple glob down here, that's actually Huntington, right? So the way the Tom and Nursen works is we want to reduce the levels of Huntington. And the way we do that is we have a piece of an oligonucleotide that binds to that RNA very specifically. So it only binds to this RNA. And uh, then a, a, a series of pathways are triggered inside of the cell to degrade that RNA. Basically, this is part of our natural what's referred to as innate immunity. When a cell sees double-stranded RNA, when it sees RNA is only supposed to be single-stranded. When it sees two strands of RNA matched up to each other, it says, aha, that is a virus. And it targets that RNA and gets rid of it. And that's, that's the mechanism that they're taking advantage of to lower Huntington levels. And indeed, from phase one and in the phase two trials, they, they did lower Huntington levels in humans. Um, there's a new class of drugs. These are two new drugs coming from two new companies. Uh, they're both very similar to each other, but they are slightly different. These are re what's referred to as splice modulators. So once again, we're talking about the RNA, right? So this is the RNA that gets read to produce the Huntington protein. And um, the best way to think about this is sort of like an old magnetic uh, cassette tape, except that the RNA that comes off, that's read off of the DNA, it needs to be processed. It has parts of it that are important to make protein and parts of it that are not. And those parts need to get cut out and it gets spliced. It gets cut and then matched up back together again, the same way you would splice old photographic film. And then you get what's referred to as your mature mRNA. This is the RNA that gets read and makes your protein. There's an important quality control pathway here that takes place inside of the cells because sometimes this RNA gets read incorrectly. And if the splicing is not done perfectly, you're going to end up making proteins that are potentially toxic. So there's a whole quality control pathway going on here. It's sort of a, uh, the analogy here of a, an assembly line in a factory where there's people making sure that the product that's coming out at the end is actually being... Um, being verified. And what we have with these new drugs, such as Branaplam from Novartis or PTC518, it's a small molecule that binds to this region of the RNA and it changes its structure so it looks like it's a mistake. And then the cell, again, the cell has, you know, all of these natural defense mechanisms, pathways that are essentially part of quality control. It sees this as a mistake and it degrades that RNA on something that's referred to as nonsense decay. And what nonsense decay means that the, the RNA that's being produced here isn't read properly, it's nonsensical, and um, it, it gets degraded through this pathway. So scientists at Branaplam, at Novartis, sorry, and PTC have been developing these ingenious molecules that will specifically, as possible, bind to this RNA and trick the cells into thinking that it should be degraded and get out of the way. All right, so why do this? Why, why do we want to use slice, splice modulators when we have ASOs, right? Because both have the same goal, both reduce the levels of Huntington. So let's compare them side by side. So ASOs are rather large molecules, 
they're they're closer to the size of the RNA itself. Um, whereas splice modulators are chemicals; they're, they're much smaller molecules. ASOs can't cross the blood-brain barrier, um, and for this reason, we need to inject them into the spine of our patients in our clinical trials and in, in, for eventual treatment. Splice modulators, though, they're small enough to cross the blood-brain barrier, and it's been demonstrated by both companies that they do it quite effectively. That means we don't need to do the spinal injection. We can do this with a pill. Um, the ASOs are extremely specific to Huntington RNA. The splice modulators, they are not as specific as ASOs. They can affect other messenger RNAs. Um, and the limitations of where the drug goes with the ASOs is where we inject it. So if we inject it into the spine, it eventually ends up up into the brain. Um, but with the splice modulators, we can actually deliver it everywhere in the human body. Uh, presumably, because it is a chemical, it's actually not a very complex chemical, actually. It's going to be much simpler to manufacture than an ASO. And we already know it has complete penetration in all tissues. It goes everywhere. That might be a good thing. It might be not a good thing. And this is why we have to pay attention to what's going on in the clinical trials for these drugs. So these are the, the two major players in splice modulators. Uh, both of these groups have been working with my lab since on and off since 2018. Um, Anu Bhattacharya over at, at PTC Therapeutics in New Jersey. Uh, they've as part of the development of this drug, they used um, human patient-derived cell lines that came out of my lab. Chang Ho Cha is now the director of um, neurodegeneration and neuroscience for Novartis Cambridge. I've known him for 20 years. He's been an HD researcher for over 20 years, uh, originally at his own lab at Harvard, and now he's running uh, the entire division of, of Novartis uh, Global. Uh, out of Cambridge. Um, and so his group is what's bringing Branaplam to Huntington's disease. And the point is, in, in showing their pictures, is these are people who have a long interest in this disease. They're not just lately uh, showing interest in the disease. They've both been working on this problem for a long time. So the status right now with these two companies, Branaplam, Branaplan was actually a drug that was developed for another disease called spinal and muscle atrophy. So this is a childhood genetic disorder. Um, and it was trialed in phase one and phase two for that disease. But now it's being pivoted over to Huntington's disease. And it has undergone a, a, a phase one trial, so a toxicity trial, and it, it, it didn't have any issues. And now it's going into phase two. It has received FDA fast track designation which means that uh, it's, their FDA is, is doing what they can to help expedite the approval of this drug because there is so much data from the previous work that they did with SMA children. The other thing that is very interesting, it is even in children, this drug is not toxic. Um, and the phase one trials showed that it was successfully lowering Huntington. And now we're at the phase two stage with a trial called Vibrant HD which is um, taking place. It started in December and it's going to take it's going to take quite a few years to go through this trial to be get us nice conclusive data until it ends in 2025. PTC 518 is in a similar stage. Um, they uh, again show that their drug works at lowering Huntington levels um, at the phase one trials and now they're in phase two trials and they've started dosing. I think one of their first clinical trials groups is in uh, Hungary. Um, and they've, they've started dosing with their drug. Uh, and this is just public data that came off of the PTC website at the end of the um, phase one trial. So they did two studies that were unfortunate acronyms of SAD and MAD. What that means is single administered dose or multiple administered dose. And what they learned from the phase one trial is it was better to give less drug multiple times a day than to give the drug once, right? So this was the effect of just giving the drug once every 24 hours. And here's the effect of the drug, uh, multiple doses over 24 hours. So they were fine. They found important data that less drug uh, taken more frequently was better than just taking it once a day. But again, this is a pill. 
right? So we're not in the situation of, of spinal injections as we are with the ASOs. So one of the, the critical questions that I'm working on with these companies in my lab is how much Huntington do we need to lower and how much is too much? And this is a really important question in pharmacology. And it was started, this kind of uh, discussion of, of, of drugs and toxicity was started by this dude here in 1493, who has the most awesome name I have ever seen, Philippus Areolus Theophrastus Bombastus von Honenheim. And he uh, was a philosopher and a scientist who came up with the, the uh, a very classically remembered phrase for those of us training in pharmacology is sola dosis facit venenum, which means only the dose makes the poison. In other words, there's drugs out there that are excellent drugs, but if you take too much of them, that's a bad thing, right? And I'll, I'll give you an example. So one example of this is a very successful drug called warfarin. Uh, this is given, it's a blood thinner. So anyone who's at a situation where they have, uh, you know, they're at risk for stroke or heart attack, they get put on low dose warfarin for a long period of time. Warfarin has saved, I would guess, millions of lives by now. It's It's been used for decades and, it, and it's a very safe and effective drug. But note, you know, the two milligrams, that's not a lot, right? You give people just a little bit of warfarin and it and it really helps them out. Now there's two places you can buy warfarin. You can get warfarin from your at, with a prescription from your pharmacy. You can also go over to Lowe's or Home Depot and get warfarin as rat poison. It's the same thing. The difference is you're giving them a lot more drug. And uh, the other important difference is this drug is bacon and cheese flavored, which I honestly think is a good idea for drugs in general, but they don't want to do that. So. It's a clear example of a little bit, the right amount of drug is of huge benefit, too much of the drug, not so huge of a benefit, right? So warfarin saved a lot of lives, killed a lot of rats. Uh, so we need to pay attention to this with, with Huntington. Another bigger question in our think tank era of, of 2020 and, and a few years before that was important questions that were asked in general for this disease is delaying Huntington's disease even possible? And what really gave us the answer for this was a massive genome-wide analysis study. This is, we went back and did genetics in the HD population. And we learned from this study that the differences in people's genetics, aside from the Huntington gene, can vary the onset of their disease by 60 years which tells us that biology has proven that you can make other differences in patients and push off their disease by half a century, which is, which is remarkable, right? So I'm, I'm, I promise I'm not gonna show you guys too many graphs, but I think this is one of the most important graphs in relation to Huntington's disease. This is a graph just showing the age of onset of disease, typically that we see in patients versus the number of CAG length the CAG repeats that they have. And what you can see here is that there's sort of this line that correlates between the two. Generally speaking, the longer your CAG length, the earlier you get disease. However, there's exceptions within this population. So at 43 repeats, which is the typical repeat length that we see in clinic, there are people that will start to see Huntington's disease at age 18 yet there are a bunch of people that won't see this disease until age 78. That's a 60 year difference. And these genetic differences are subtle, arguing that if we can mimic this with drugs, we can mimic this effect. And these are the targets that we found as a result of this, these studies. This is part of uh, you know, larger studies that are being done like Track HD where we looked at 16,000 patients worldwide and you get these very definitive data and this came down to two proteins primarily of interest something called fan1 and something called msh32 the first thing that we learned about this is it's all about the dna and the repair of dna so fan1 is a known disease protein and another disease referred to as fanconi's anemia MSH32 is well known 
to the cancer community uh, because it's involved in important DNA damage repair that, that if it isn't correct, could, can result in cancer. And what we're learning from the population is if you have low levels of FAN1 protein or FAN1 activity, HD comes earlier. If you have high levels of MSH3, uh, HD comes earlier. And this argues that uh, from a drug perspective, it's very hard generally to increase levels of a protein. It is much easier to inhibit a protein as a target. But what this has given us is two immediately new targets for Huntington's disease. And this was really revealed to us around 2015, 2016. And so why is MSH3 bad? MSH3 is bad because it's involved in the second step of Huntington's disease. The first step is simply being born with over 37 CAG repeats. The set, but that's not a problem. If people just had 37 repeats, even in their brain, they probably would be fine or they'd live to 90 before it, it even became an issue. But the second step is the problem. And that's what's referred to as, as ex somatic expansion, right? This is the idea that your Huntington gene may have 43 repeats if we take blood out of your arm or look at your muscle tissue in your leg, but in the brain, those repeats are expanding out over lifetime, over 100 repeats, and that's the problem that's occurring. So the target here is obvious. If we can inhibit or lower MSH3 protein levels, we inhibit the expansion of the CAG DNA and prevent the problem of 43 becoming 100 in the brain. So this is actively being targeted by two drug companies that are quite far along in their drug discovery process. One of them's in, in Boston, in Cambridge, Triplet Therapeutics. The other one is in the UK, uh, Locus 23 Therapeutics, which is headed by Carolyn Ben. Uh, so Dr. Ben, again, is another person who, who, she's had quite a long career in drug discovery, and she worked for a while with the Dementia Discovery Fund, uh, but she has a long history in HD. Before she was doing all of this, she was a postdoctoral fellow working for Chang Ho Cha when he had his lab at Harvard. And before she worked for Chang Ho Cha, she got her PhD with Gillian Bates at University College London. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, Jill Bates is the person who developed the first mouse model for Huntington's disease. So Dr. Ben has a long history and a long passion behind getting this disease going. She is now, uh, as of 2021, uh, received a nice amount of venture capital funding and essentially enough money for Locus 23 to go where they want to go to get us a drug to clinical trial. I'd say uh, they're going to be in that position in a matter of a year or two. Um, back in my lab again, though, we got, well, so we have this genetic evidence that DNA damage is important in Huntington's disease, but what's the direct evidence that this has anything to do with the Huntington protein? Is Huntington involved in DNA repair? And the short answer is yes. And this really comes out of work out of someone who is well known to this community, Dr. Tamara Maori, who's a research associate in my lab. And she discovered in 2017 that in fact, yes, Huntington does directly respond to DNA damage. And we do this with the technology that we use in my lab, which is uh, various levels of live cell microscopy. So the first thing that we've discovered is that when cells are under stress, um, which means chemical stress is related to aging, Huntington responds by moving from the periphery of the cell into the nucleus of the cell, and that's where the DNA is. And what Tamara directly discovered was if we zap damage onto this DNA using a high-powered laser, Huntington starts accumulating onto that damaged DNA. And this is a really critical finding that says that this correlates with what we saw from our 16,000 people in, in clinical trials, in, in the, sorry, in clinical studies that led us to understand that there's something going wrong with the DNA in Huntington's disease. And there are drugs being developed around this. Now, for the first time, I'm presenting this data. So I've actually never presented this data scientifically to the HD community. You guys are going to see this first. This is in part 
the result of a successful facility that I've been working on with others to build at McMaster, several million dollars investment from the university and from various other agencies, where we are looking at new imaging techniques at the microscopy level. This is something referred to as atomic force microscopy. Um, basically, the idea here is we use uh, the equivalent of a, a phonograph needle, except really, really small. And it drags across the surface of a chip where we're looking at proteins and DNA together. And we could in fact now, and this, this data is literally three weeks old, we can see Huntington binding to DNA. So this long strand here is DNA on the chip. If you look very closely, if you stick your nose right up to your computer monitor, you can actually see the helix of the DNA. You know, the, the DNA has this helical shape. You can actually see that. And you can see that Huntington is binding the ends of this DNA and binding within the DNA. And this was done with uh, Dr. Sarah Andres, who's an expert on this, uh, working at McMaster and her PhD candidate student, Monica Warner, uh, who are just two, a couple of exceptional people. So to get an idea of, of how small we're looking at here, this is 500 by 500 nanometers in size. The human, a human hair is typically 80,000 nanometers. So this is ex like probably the, the smallest level of, um, of accuracy that we can get by imaging right now using current, te <laughs> using current technologies. Okay, we've also, again, led by uh, Dr. Mowry's work in my lab, as we're showing recently, and this is we're getting ready for publication, is that the very first step in DNA repair is being inhibited by mutant Huntington before disease onset. We're seeing this in people 15, 20 years before we anticipate that they're going to start getting HD. It's an important protein called PARP1 enzyme. It's the thing that actually sees the damage in the DNA. So there's that double helix I was talking to you about, which we could see in the atomic force scan. This glob of what looks like chewing gum sticks onto it, and it produces these chains of nucleic acid called PAR, polyADP ribose. The best analogy I can have is this little movie here. So we've got damaged DNA, we've got the PARP1 enzyme that sits on top of that damaged DNA, and the job of PARP1 is to produce these chains to recruit DNA proteins to come and fix the problem. And the way it does that is it makes these chains and they spread out from the site of damage, and some proteins will bind to those chains and come to the site of DNA damage to do the repair. And one of those proteins you guessed it, is Huntington. And we can actually directly visualize this now. Now, the older data that I showed you is three weeks old. This data is literally one week old. So we can actually see what these PAR chains look like. So the little yellow spot in the middle, that's the PARP enzyme. And these are all the chains, that fishing net that's getting spread out around the DNA damage. And Huntington, very interestingly, binds to these chains. It actually helps this process when the protein is not mutated. But when the protein is mutant, as seen in Huntington's disease, it inhibits it. And this is a critical, and this is something that we think we can address with lowering the Huntington protein. Uh, sorry, one more graph, and this is it. You don't even need to pay attention to the graph other than just to pay attention to this. When we treat our human-derived cells, with a drug like branoplam, we fix the PAR levels in the cell and we fix the DNA damage. These are events that are hap that are very first events on the tra on the track to HD, and both are being fixed with the uh, administration of these drugs. And importantly, a lot less drug than we think we needed with the ASO trials. It looks like we only need to lower Huntington about 25%, not 50% as we thought we needed for the other trials, arguing that less drug may be necessary, and in most cases, less drug is better. So all of this in terms of our thinking of these clinical trials and what went on with ASO and our understanding of looking at what's going on in what's referred to as prodromal HD, 
also known as pre-manifest HD, depending on which side of the pond you live on. But, uh, you know, this is a, a typical graphic I have of human aging. Uh, sorry, this is only dudes. It's not, I couldn't get one for women. Uh, you know, but in the in the process here, we're all somewhere along this this pathway. Hopefully, I'm more here than here. But anyway, um, we've got a, a long phase most of the lives of people where they're they're prodromal for HD. There is no disease, but then clinical HD appears. And typically, we've been using this model of okay, we have no disease, we have disease, and then we think about a therapy. And when we did our clinical trials our first clinical trials in Huntington's disease, we really focused in this bracket here in green on when we were going to start trialing to, to uh, attempt to correct this disease. But we're getting further and further evidence worldwide that this is, there are not harsh stages where this happens and that HD is really a gradient that starts a lot sooner with some very, very subtle differences that appear even in childhood, even in development. However, there's, there's not disease there. There's no difference. There's no, otherwise no difference in this population, but it just says that there's something that is slightly different and we need to pay attention to that because if we pay attention to these differences very early in life and we now think about drugs to fix this at this position in life, this is not going to happen. Aging is still going to happen. Sorry, can't do anything about that. But it's very likely that we can stop the onset of disease. It just won't happen. And already from our clinical trials, we've learned that we need to move that green bracket closer to either early HD or people that are very close to predicted onset of HD in order to get an idea if these drugs are working properly. So the idea is that we there's a cascade in Huntington's disease. There's a problem that takes place at the top here, and there's a domino effect that causes a whole bunch of problems eventually leading to Huntington's disease. But if we go in here very early and figure out what the very first steps are, we can prevent this cascade from occurring, right? So here's the drug being applied, and there you go. Fix the whole problem all the way down the stream, and this cat is now a hero. Um, it's another thing we found out in 2020, there's a hell of a lot of cat videos on the internet. So there's been some important successes from these clinical trials. The independent safety monitoring worked, right? This is a third party group that does not work for Roche, does not work for anyone except for themselves to, and, and for the HD community and whoever's in the clinical trials to make sure that if there's any concern about safety, that a trial is stopped and that, that worked beautifully. We see that these drugs are lowering Huntington in humans. We now have four drugs that do this. We know that we will get more conclusive data if we look at earlier HD. And so the both the PTC and the Novartis trials are looking at earlier, uh, earlier HD recruits. This caused a huge interest uh, and influx of, of capital and pharma interest in 2020 and 2021 and 22, it's only expanded. So there's two new trials already underway, as I've just talked to you about, more are coming. So we're, we've never been in a better position here. And it's frankly, I think I've never had um, an innate sense of optimism on this like I've had right now with these current clinical trials that are going. I think this is really good news. And importantly, we have a new approach to clinical trials in HD. And we need to work with funding agencies and with regulatory agencies on this on the concept that we're not going to wait for people to get sick. It may be too late. What we need to do is treat people before they get sick. And that could have a much more profound effect and mimic what we're seeing in the natural biology that we saw from the genomic studies that if it's very subtle changes, we're not talking about these FAN1 or MSH3 protein levels or activity, they are very subtle, but they can have uh, an effect of 60 years or more. And that's, that's profound. And fr frankly, that's a home run. Um, this slide is just showing you the, the awesome people I have in my lab. My lab has expanded uh, tremendously. It's one of the reasons why I'm really not uh, able to have time to work on the scientific advisory board with the HSC, although I'm still 
I'm not going anywhere. I'm still very much involved with with helping them out. Um, but we, you know, this the lab has has increased in size uh, dramatically and will increase in size dramatically more this year. Um, this really is a world effort. We have collaborators from all over the world, uh, in particular with Johns Hopkins, with two labs, with Ted and Belina Dawson and Tay and Can. A lot of our clinical data is coming from working with Ed Wild, um, a neurologist at UC London, who a lot of you know, Francesca Cicchetti at Université de Laval in Quebec, and uh, of course people in, in McMaster and various industrial partners like Novartis and into DNA in Poland. Um, and, uh, and you know, I have a lot of people to thank in terms of federal and provincial funding agencies at various levels, including the Hereditary Disease Foundation in the United States, the Society of Canada, the Kremble Foundation has been a continual support of this lab, absolutely critical. We have this awesome new facility at McMaster, the Center for Advanced Light Microscopy. I'm one of the co-directors of it. I have all the equipment I need right now, I want for nothing in terms of state-of-the-art equipment to start answering these questions. And um, I think it's gonna be a very exciting time coming up. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Turns out I'm only one minute over, which is awesome. And uh, I'll take any questions that people have. I'm sure people have questions. or not. I don't know, Ian, do you want to tell them how to exactly type in questions? They have, right? And if you click on the question tab, you'll be able to see there's a couple there right now. Yeah, fortunately, I'm not seeing them. Okay, I will <laughs> read them. Up, read them up. I can't see. It, it, I'll read them. From uh, Maria Coles, is there any trials for those with more advanced disease or are the trials geared for those preclinical or early diagnosis? Yeah, so right now, no. Short answer, no. And the reason for that is um, what we learned from uh, the Roche data is in the cohort of people that were more advanced in diseases, just because of the nature of the disease, you know, uh, HD leads to other problems. And it's very difficult to parse out what's working and what's not working in that population. At this point, we're really looking, we want to get conclusive answers. We want to know if something's working. If something's working, we're all in on it, right? And the idea is we're going to get that from looking at earlier disease because it's a much more defined um, disease that we can see where things are, are going wrong and if we're fixing them with the drugs. That will mean, though, that typically those drugs will probably end up trialing it or, or, or administration in people that have more advanced disease. That's the reason why we are looking earlier now. Great. And um, question, do you do, uh, do you do clinical trials at McMaster for HD? No, we don't do clinical. I'm not a clinical trials person. Uh, clinical trials are taken, uh, taken place across Canada across the world, actually. We don't, we don't really pay attention to, to borders on this kind of thing. Um, it's just a, a function of which, which centers were more ready to go. And that was a function of how different countries are dealing with COVID. Our uh, biggest clinical trial center in Canada is probably Dr. Blair Levitt at the CMMT in Vancouver. Um, but we have trial centers in, um, in Edmonton, in Montreal, um, uh, we now have uh, clinics uh, closer to Toronto that have taken over from Dr. Gutman now that he's retired. Um, and we have um, a bunch of centers across the U.S. and across Europe worldwide. Great. Um, how soon do you think a drug will be on the market for promotional people like, like me? Yeah, so, uh, so the, as you can see from the length of the trial, when we're talking about prodromal HD, it takes a long time to figure out if something's working, right? So we've got a five-year plan time period. So 2025 is going to be the end of this trial uh, with Novartis. It, if, it, if there is promising data, it will end sooner. Um, so, you know, the, the 2025 is the absolute end stop date, right? But in a lot of these diseases, if, they, if people are seeing things really promising early, 
without any toxicity, because of the fast track uh, designation from the FDA, we could see earlier approval. So I think we're gonna I think we're gonna be having a very very different conversations with our community in five years. Actually, 2025 is only is what we're talking about. It's three years, three years away. <laughs> Um, they were, the community was told in 2009 that a cure was three to five years away. Uh, where do they, where do we stand on that now? And how long until we could expect a treatment, uh, with a comment, awesome presentation, Dr. Trent. Uh, first of all, thanks. So I think I kind of answered that question with, with someone else, but we've had, um, there are some other trials that are taking place, uh, that I don't know that much about. So I haven't really talked about them because I don't have any authority to understand what's going on with them, but. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, trials are uh, not always dedicated to finding a, a drug and getting a cure out or a treatment quickly. A lot of these trials are about just getting information from humans. You have to understand that before 2020, the only information that we had in terms of trying to therapeutically alter Huntington's disease came from rodents. And rodents are powerful models to use in research, but they're not humans. There's very many differences between a mouse and a human at the molecular level. Uh, so with other diseases, we know from experience, you have this incremental knowledge information towards a therapeutic in a, in a model system. Once you start clinical trials, everything ramps up significantly because we go in leaps and bounds once we start getting data from people and not mice. Uh, so it's very difficult to give numbers, you know, about when things are going to come to fruition. I don't like to use that typical five year number because frankly, every press release you read from every university on every researcher has that five year number. And I just don't think it's accurate. I think this is a, this is working in progress, and people like me in the HD community will, are, you know, we're we're sharing our latest information with you with you guys, and uh, you know, the community. It's it. We're all researchers at this point, guys working in the lab, but we're nowhere without people not in clinic in these clinical trials, getting information from them and with our partner clinicians who are treating HD patients and running these trials and people like, you know, Dr. Levitt. Um, so, and I need, I need samples from people uh, through various, harvested through various clinical studies and that's with Dr. Wild. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're all involved in this research right now and, uh, and we're extremely well coordinated in HD, better than any other disease that I know. So if anyone's primed for success, it's us. Great. I, I, we have time for one more question. I will make one more I have one more comment I'd like to read to you, Ray. You can't see it. Uh, no question, but I just wanted to say thank you, Dr. Truitt. As someone who's found out she was HD positive last year, all of the information gave me huge hope. Thank you for the work you're the hard work you're doing for all HD families. Well, you're welcome. And 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 frankly, you know, notes like that from people is what drives my lab. Excellent. And uh, final question. Um, interesting. What made you choose to study HD? We'll leave it at that. <laughs> so uh, I'm when I was uh, training as as a postdoctoral fellow, I was actually a Howard Hughes scholar at uh, Duke University. And I wasn't working in neurodegeneration. I was working in HIV in the 1996-1999. Uh, so this is a period of time where HIV research shifted from uh, to actual treatments that came to fruition. And the basic aspect of the virus research uh, wasn't really impacting that anymore. So I had to go look for an, another disease. But while I was there, I was very interested in a very active Alzheimer's disease research uh, program that was taking place at the university. And I was very interested in neurodegeneration, but I had some very early conversations with people who basically said, you know, if you want to understand Alzheimer's or Parkinson's or any of these very common neurodegenerative diseases, 
you really need to understand a disease where we absolutely know what the cause is. You need to look at some disease that is genetic and a monogenetic disease, which means it comes from one gene, right? And so when I call myself an HD researcher, I'm really interested in neurodegeneration. And the only way we're going to figure that out is by knowing what causes the disease specifically in, in a certain group of people. Because the biggest problem with Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease is we don't know what causes 99% of it for people who show up in clinic. And so how do you work on a disease that has 20 or 30 different causes? Uh, how can you possibly derive a therapeutic? And how do you even clinically trial it when you have people coming into clinic with very many different causes? That's not the case in Huntington's disease. There is only one reason why people have Huntington's disease. And we know exactly what it is and what to look for. And now we're looking at even before people get sick, which you can't do in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. So that's mainly the reason why I'm interested in HD. Excellent, Ray. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Trent. Uh, it truly was amazing to be able to hear about these advances and what we've learned from recent clinical trials. We're so fortunate to have you as a trusted advisor and a committed partner. We truly appreciate you being our keynote and thank you for your time you spent on this presentation. And uh, we really enjoyed listening to you. Okay, everyone, we're moving on to our first breakout session. Uh, you can just select your presentation from the home screen and enjoy the rest of the conference.